so we know what we need to do. We need to work for a more just and a more ecological economy. But the foundations of that, from my perspective, will be very different from what most people who've been critiquing capitalism, they've been doing it, from my point of view, through industrial lenses, not through indigenous lenses. The fundamental things that we do as human beings that we have valued through our whole evolution are how we grow our children and how we grow our food. All of us in intergenerational communities were involved with both of those. And in the modern economy, people have been driven away from both. And that system originally was, you know, was Christianity. Later on, it was force, slavery, and enclosures in Europe that drove Europeans also away from a land-based existence. So I'm so amazed, you know, when I hear about the most remote parts of like Papua and in Africa, and they've, they're called Joseph and Mary. And I know that, I know what the impact of that is, and it is to create a sense of inferiority. So there's been this psychological pollution from a dominant Western system. I was trying to get this message out because I had become quite scared, I would say, of the impact of a global economy which was everywhere imposing a consumer monoculture. So what the Christians did was to also impose a monoculture, but they didn't reach the whole world. And the colonial powers, well, let's say slavery, they didn't enslave the entire globe. And even in the colonial era, every single person on the planet wasn't being affected by this. But here we were already by the, by the mid-70s, late 70s. Virtually every child was being colonized by a false idea of identity, of, of power, of intelligence, of beauty, colonized in a really disastrous way. And so I saw this as it came into Ladakh, and later on I worked in Bhutan, which many of you will have heard of, a little kingdom in the Himalayas, in a similar situation to Ladakh. And I saw there how even aged four or five, children were affected by these visuals. And they were literally, at that time, literally Barbie dolls for girls and Rambos with machine guns for boys. governments were ratifying treaties with corporations. They sounded like they were treaties between countries, but they weren't. It was literally Sweden, United States, Japan, and countries around the world being subjugated by Coca-Cola, Monsanto, HSBC, and essentially global monopolies were getting governments to sign treaties that allowed them freedom. The big banks and corporations were getting more and more power over our every avenue of knowledge, every avenue of knowledge, school books, uh, science, university, media. I still feel quite hopeful because I think that even though there's been this enormous co-optation going on, everywhere I go, I see people trying to do things differently. And from my analysis, the worst culture that we've ever had, the nadir of Western culture, was in the Victorian age, when this push driving people off the land and also accompanied by the idea that living close to the land is inferior and backward. A whole constellation of things happened also, remember, the history was Christianity. So the body, sensuality, wholeness, right brain, all of this became seen as backward, messy, dirty. They covered piano legs. You couldn't even see a piano leg because that might get someone aroused. So it was really the nadir of this culture, so anti-nature, anti-feminine, anti, I mean, totally racist, and those were the values of the slave owners 
and the colonizers, explicit values. You can read it. They'll talk, and they talk about schooling as being a type of factory breeding of children to suit their new industries. So that was the cultural nadir, and ever since that time, our culture has actually been moving more towards nature, towards the feminine, towards respect for indigenous people, towards all the values that we all share here. They've had bleeps because particularly in the last 10 years or so, as many people have been marginalized in this economy, been made to just struggle to survive, you get the Bolsonaros and Trumps who come up and say, we're gonna make our country great again for you and forget about these immigrants and climate. We're gonna grow the economy, grow the economy and make your country great when they're actually continuing to grow the economy for a smaller and smaller group of people. This is what's so crazy and why I believe we might have a breakthrough because the truth is now that the direction of the economy is such that we are talking about vastly less than 1% getting richer and richer and richer. And we're seeing it. Less than 1%. And what do they want to do, those guys? They want to go to Mars to fight over more minerals. They want to go to the deepest seabed to fight over minerals, to use more minerals, energy, and technology while replacing people. So the new, the path before us is to understand that bigger picture, to embrace a human and ecological culture, not a techno-economic surveillance culture. I think most of us now realize that there's a lot to learn from indigenous cultures, particularly indigenous cultures where you know, women had high status, where the feminine had high status. So my indigenous lenses made me embrace going smaller, going slower, and that means local. It means particularly local food but local community. I just want to explain that when you help to shorten the distance between the farm and the consumer, you are doing something miraculous. You are going against these 500 years where already with slavery, what the traders were doing was separating people from the source of their food, preventing diversified production for their needs as a priority, a type of self-reliance, which was never self-reliance, it was community reliance. You know, there was never any one family going off, you know, growing everything for themselves, but you had community reliance and you had a priority to produce the things you need and then you trade when there's a bit of surplus and you bring in things that you can't produce. What they did with slavery was to totally destroy that, push people onto cotton fields, into tin plantations, coffee plantations, etc. And in England, with the enclosures, they push people away from not only that diversified production, but a range of human scale institutions which they had developed over many hundreds, if not thousands of years. They weren't perfect, it's not that it was perfect, but it's the foundation of where we need to be to have something that could be pretty bloody amazing. <laughs>